Hello there, welcome back to the new video. Today we'll be talking about this paper, which is titled as Inductive Representation Learning on Large Graphs. This is from researchers from Stanford. So let's start with the abstract. So this is one of the early foundational works in the domain of graph neural networks, which propose a technique called Graph Sage. So earlier on this channel, we have already gone through many papers from 2014 onwards till 2017 roughly, about learning representation for various objects in the graph, such as nodes, edges, or even whole graphs. And one of the major limitations that we had over there, those systems were shallow and were inherently transductive, which means they were not generalizable to the new nodes that were not seen during the training set. So with GraphSage, we overcome this limitation by learning a function that generates these representations based on a transform and aggregate framework based on the local neighborhood of the concerned node. And once you have these functions ready and trained, you can directly apply these functions or weights to the new node that comes in to compute its representation. So if you see this figure, so this is a very high level illustration to how GraphSage exactly works. So the first step is to sample the neighborhood for any concerned node. So let's say if this was the node that we were interested in, we go to its one hop neighbors, which is at the distance of one and to its two hop neighbors, which you can see with these concentric circles. And within the one hop neighbors, we sample some of the nodes. So let's say this was the one, this one, and this one. And similarly, we sample some nodes from the second hop, which are these, 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 and these. So now this is a computation graph, which this nodes actually carries. And similarly, you can think of when you choose any other node, it will have its own computation graph based on the number of hops you have decided and based on the sample size at every hop. So once the first part is done, the next step is to propagate the message that each of the neighborhood nodes had. So for example, this node, what you see over here, accepts the information from this one and this one. And similarly, this one accepts the information from this one and this one. And eventually, when all of these blue nodes have gotten their representation, they propagate it to the red one and the red one has its final representation. So all these blue colored and the red colored node that you see, right, have an aggregator function also attached to them, which kind of aggregates to how do you want to merge, let's say all these three blue colored arrows. So again, there are various methods to how you can define an aggregator function. As we go forward in this paper, we'll discuss all of these, but clearly that function should be order invariant, which means if I give this node first or this node first, that should not matter to it. So some of which you can easily think of could be, let's say mean, sum, all of that, right? But yeah, we'll read about them in detail as we go forward. So this is what the aggregator function is. And then obviously you can have an intermediate layer for each of the edges that you see, which kind of does a linear transformation to the early node representation to each of the neighbors had. So that's when the starting I had said, like graph sage follows transform followed by an aggregate method. So now this is what is happening for one node. And similarly, the same process will be repeated for all of the nodes that you have. And now you can wrap everything around epoch to how many number of times you want to do this process again and again. And for training, again, you can sample some mini batches to train these networks. So once the model is trained and you have your weights freezed, now comes the task of, let's say, how do you define embedding for a new node that comes on the fly? So now let's say we have a new node that comes in, which is, let's say this one, and this gets attached to this node and this node. So similarly, we can again define the computation graph for this node. Let's say this is the main node, and then it's connected to just two nodes, which is this one and this one. And since you already have some embedding representation for these, because these were the nodes that were already present during the training data, you can pass them through the aggregator function of the kth layer and get the representation for this node. So yeah, this is essentially how you go about scaling it. And if you talk about how do you train or get the embeddings for this red colored node at the first place, again, you can do it in a supervised or unsupervised fashion. So for example, in a supervised, you can have, let's say, the initial label for this node as spam or not spam based on the cross entropy loss. You can then back propagate and train each of those computation graphs. And for unsupervised, you, you can use the property to what we used in node to work or deep work, which was that if two nodes are neighbors of each other, then in high dimensional space, also they'll be close to each other. So you try to optimize on that loss. So I think this paper discusses both of these techniques. So we'll revisit them again as we move forward. Okay. So if you go through the forward propagation algorithm, so for this, we assume like the training has already been done and we have all these K aggregator functions already trained and the parameters are freezed. So we'll denote each of the aggregator function by this. And the weight matrix at every level is given by W superscript K, where K is nothing but the level, which indirectly means the hop length. So if you see the pseudo code for this, the input to this function is supposed to be a graph which has V vertices and E edges. And then you have some input representation or feature representation for every node already, which could be let's say node degree, for example, or at very basic, it could be just the one hot encoded vector for that node. And then you have the depth K, which kind of defines how deep do you want to go in the network and take information from there. 
and then again you have the weight matrix you have the non-linearity and then aggregator functions so each hop will have its own aggregator function so if there are multiple aggregator functions to be learned at, at every level then they'll have their shared parameters and then you have the neighborhood function that takes in a node v and finds out all the neighborhood for that node and the output is nothing but a dense vector representation for every node also this value of k what you see over here right is usually set to two or three maximum and again for some obvious reasons because if you go more deep it would kind of resemble that every node is taking information from all the nodes which might eventually lead up to learning similar embeddings for every node so instead of propagating so deep in the graph we just set it to two or three maximum so that the computation graph that every node holds is little exclusive to that because of which you'll have diversity and learn different embeddings so yeah we start off with the feature representation for every node that we define which could be let's say one hot encoding and then for every depth that we have we follow this loop and once we are out of this loop we have kth level representation for every node so let's see what this loop does so under each depth we go through each of the vertices so for any particular vertex you calculate the neighborhood for that node you get the representation for those nodes from the previous depth and pass them through an aggregator function so for now you can think of this as a mean so let's say you had three neighbors so you'll have let's say this are the representation for that you take the mean of these three vectors and get a new vector where each of the element of that mean representation is nothing but the mean of their respective elements at that position so now this is nothing but the representation of the node v for the depth k for which you traverse the information for the neighborhoods from the previous node and now to get the final representation for the node v we concatenate the embedding of v that it had in the previous depth along with the aggregated function that you have we concatenate both of these embeddings do a linear transformation and then pass it through a non-linearity and finally we'll have a kth depth representation for this node so you keep repeating this process for all the nodes and eventually perform the normalization and finally when all of these depths have been traversed you return the representation that you have learned so if you see this figure let's say this is the central node v that we have these are its neighbors let's say it had three neighbors so now to get a representation for v th node for the kth depth is nothing but what you get from these neighboring nodes as a part of k minus 1th step along with whatever value you had in the k minus 1 step so you combine all of that wherein you have the aggregator function that combines the representation for the nodes that were there in the neighborhood after which you concatenate the representation for this node itself followed by a linear transformation and non-linearity so yeah this is the forward propagation for graph sage once you have these parameters fixed so here if you see the learnable parameters are nothing but this wk and you could have aggregator function also learned also if you would like you could do a linear transformation for the representation for every neighboring node so if you do that you'll have again one more parameter to be learned okay so now we talk about the learning of the parameters for the graph sage so this is the loss function that they define it has two terms let's call this as t1 and this entire thing as t2 so the authors propose both supervised as well as unsupervised technique for doing the same wherein for the unsupervised as we had already discussed in earlier work such as node to vec and deep walk where the idea is if the two nodes are co-occurring in a certain window then in some higher dimension representation they should also be close to each other so that's the objective for the unsupervised and for supervised it's pretty easy because you'll have anyways a ground truth label for every node and the prediction will be certain probability you can easily apply the cross entropy loss for calculating the same which can be for example written as if you had two classes you will have let's say t log p the minus of t log p minus 1 minus t log of 1 minus p where p is the probability of you predicting a certain class and t is the ground truth label so for example in the case of fraud and not fraud you will have a one hot vector saying this is a representation for fraud and this let's say is a representation for not fraud and accordingly you can put the values of t and get this cross entropy loss now if we talk about the unsupervised loss which is this equation one so here u and v are nothing but the nodes that occur in a certain random walk of length l so if this dot product is really high which means these are very much similar if you pass it through sigmoid you will get a value that's close to one and as we know log of value that's close to one approaches zero from the negative so this overall value will be tending to zero so now t1 has done its job and it's kind of pushing this term towards zero now let's see what t2 is exactly doing so we take expectation over nodes that are not in a similar random walk and we calculate their dot product so ideally since these are far away nodes those should also not be similar in some high dimensional space so which means this dot product is going to be really low negative of that will make it really high then sigmoid of very high value will tend to one again log of value that's close to one will tend to zero from its negative side which again will make this entire thing close to zero 
So this way T2 also optimizes on the cases where nodes are far away and are supposed to be dissimilar in that high dimensional space. Now this Q term what you see over here defines the total number of negative samples that you might want to consider for calculating this loss and indirectly it's also giving weightage to the T2 term. So yeah this is about how you calculate loss for the node ZU in the graph G. And then you take the partial derivative of this with respect to the weights W which is the parameter at every depth and then if your aggregative function also is parameterized then that can also be tuned. And also as I had talked earlier, like you can have an extra parameter w that gets multiplied to the k minus 1 representation of that node. So this is the transformation also that you can have if you want. So eventually you'll end up training these three parameters. Okay. Okay, so now talking about the final part of the paper, which is how do you define aggregator functions and what are the different architectures for this? So the first one that they discuss is called mean aggregator. So if you see this equation, this is nothing but the representation that you have for the neighboring nodes in the previous depth and also the representation for the central node for the previous depth. You take the mean of all of that, do a linear transformation, pass it through nonlinearity, and that is the current representation for the central node. So this is somewhat similar to what GCN paper also introduced, but they had some normalization factor over there. And since it's a plain mean, so you have the weightage also equally distributed for the contribution from the neighboring node and this node itself. So yeah, this is one of the ways that they define. The second is called LSTM aggregator. Also before that, if we see this again, we are directly getting the representation for that node at the kth step. Unlike in the pseudo algorithm where we saw a concat function that took h of v k minus 1 and concatenated that with the aggregator of the neighboring nodes. Okay, so talking about the LSTM aggregator now. So before this, one more thing that we have been constantly discussing like the aggregator function should be order invariant. Again, for the same fact that if we consider this one first, let's say, or this one second, or the vice versa, the output should be same. So the ordering should not matter over here. But LSTM, as we know, are sequential methods that inherently capture this temporal pattern. So to adapt LSTM to operate on this unordered set, they train LSTMs by feeding it random permutation of the neighboring nodes. So with this, they are trying to force LSTM to be symmetric. Okay. The third and the final one is called the pooling aggregator. So this is the exact thing what I have been mentioning. Like you can have an extra parameter or extra network that will try to combine all the representations for the neighborhoods. And eventually you can take an element wise max over all these transform representation. With this you get aggregate pool. And again, as we saw in the pseudo algorithm, you can do a concat with the current one and this aggregated one, have a linear layer, do a non-linear transformation. And this is the representation that you have. So yeah. I think now we're done with the paper. Now they have experiments and all. So before you move on, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also share it across with your friends whosoever is interested in such content. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye-bye.